<clears throat> crypto is you know, it's really interesting because people think it's some sort of weird internet funny money and it's not related to anything else. It's pure macro. It's pure macro. It aligns perfectly with the global liquidity cycle. Its risk curve is the same liquidity cycle as the... Welcome back to Crypto Insights. In his latest interview on Steno Research, Raul Pal discusses the intersection of cryptocurrency and the broader macroeconomic landscape. He emphasizes that crypto is not isolated but deeply connected to global macro trends. Raul Pal explores the alignment of crypto with the global liquidity cycle, pointing out that its risk curve corresponds to the liquidity cycle of bonds. The discussion covers the relationship between financial conditions, global liquidity, and various economic indicators. Raul Pal predicts that global liquidity will continue to increase, driving the performance of technology and crypto assets. He highlights the cyclical nature of global rates and the predictable four-year cycle, suggesting that global liquidity will extend into 2024 and 2025. Pal contrasts the potential outperformance of technology and crypto with traditional assets like commodities and emerging markets. He argues that, based on the risk-return perspective, technology and crypto offer higher returns for the same unit of risk. The upcoming Bitcoin ETF and the subsequent focus on Ethereum are discussed as part of the macro cycle, leading to an alt season for smaller tokens. Overall, Raul Pal sees crypto as a macro trade, closely tied to global liquidity cycles and investor behavior. He expresses a preference for high-risk, high-return assets like technology and crypto, aligning with the anticipated macroeconomic conditions. We will bring you the highlights of this interview, so please don't forget to subscribe and liking the video. So financial conditions lead um, global liquidity by five months. And financial conditions have been, they, they corrected somewhat as stocks corrected, or certainly NASDAQ and stuff corrected. But really, it's, it's now going up as the dollars come down, uh, commodities have come down, and um, rates have come down somewhat. So global liquidity f five months out should continue to increase. Um, and that you can also see that when you look at it versus ISM. So this one is um, weekly liquidity versus ISM forward-looking, i.e. 15 months inverted. The reason that occurs is because we're in this perfectly cyclical pattern that I, came, that I talked about last time I was on the show about the everything code, which is where global rates reset in 2008 at zero, and all governments refinance all of their debts between three and five years. So you're getting this perfect four-year cycle that repeats. That perfect four-year cycle suggests that global liquidity just keeps going into 2024 and into 2025. And so we've just used that as the main guide. Now, it won't be perfect, but it feels that way because election years, what usually happens in election years? Well, stimulus. Then we look at global liquidity and say, well, what's happening in China? Well, they've got a deflationary bust going on right now, and the outcome will be more cowbell, be more liquidity. The Europeans are looking like that they're going to be the first to cut rates. So there's liquidity. So everywhere I look, and the UK will follow suit at some point as well. So in which case, the main liquidity drivers of the, the Fed, the BOE, the ECB, PBOC, and the BOJ had been easing all year with yield curve control. We'll see what they do as well. Right. And the business cycle drives the rest of the assets. So if liquidity continues to improve and there will be some ups and downs and whatever, then technology and crypto will continue to outperform. But for people who don't like the racier end of the risk curve, 2024 gets very interesting finally for everybody in small caps. Finally, for everybody in emerging markets, because the dollar should weaken as well. Finally, for everybody in commodities. You know, everyone had a false start in oil and they got absolutely slaughtered. Um, so we should see the traditional cyclical style economy pick up. But for me, they're the least interesting. Because what I've learned to do, if, if we are facing one gigantic, one delta Risk on, risk off world based around the global debt cycle, right? Then diversification doesn't add any benefits. So what 
what it dawned on me a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, is that actually, if this cycle is predictable, and I think this cycle will be, the next one, I don't know yet, but let's assume that this one's relatively predictable. Well, then you want to focus on the highest risk return you can get from the same unit of risk, the most return you can get from the same unit of risk. And on a risk-adjusted basis, again, technology and crypto outperform everything by a giant margin. And if I just look at a chart of NASDAQ versus anything else, kills it because they're both in secular trends. So in which case, armed with that information, I just can't get excited about owning commodities or emerging markets. What are emerging markets? They have a great year next year. Let's say they're up 50%. What's Bitcoin going to be up? 300? You know, and that's the issue I'm facing. And it's not because I'm a ridiculous optimist. It's actually because I'm so pessimistic that I realize that it's all driven by the same liquidity cycle now. And therefore, it's actually potentially the greatest gift we've ever been given as a macro trade. (laughs) Crypto is, you know, it's really interesting because people think it's some sort of weird internet funny money and it's not related to anything else. It's pure macro. It's pure macro. It aligns perfectly with the global liquidity cycle. Its risk curve is the same liquidity cycle as the bond risk curve, for example. So the first part of a recovery process, what you tend to see is treasury bonds rallying first, then you tend to go further out the risk curve, and then two years later, everyone's doing local market, high-risk, private sector lending in the worst emerging markets in the world as they seek risk, right? It's the same in crypto. So the first part of the bull market is always led by Bitcoin. We did get one breakout, which was Solana, which killed it, you know, because it had its own adoption story. But generally speaking, what happens is once that global liquidity year on year goes positive, and it's very close now, that's when the risk curve ignites. That's when Ethereum starts outperforming Bitcoin, and we get what's known as alt season, which is the smaller tokens as people just go out the risk curve. That also corresponds with the Bitcoin ETF. So again, think of investor behavior. It's very typical for you and I, because we've lived TradFi, but a lot of crypto people are new to understanding these things. So Bitcoin ETF, everyone's front running it. What happens the day it's announced? Well, usually there's probably a sell-off, you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact, fine. And then everybody, once the dust clears, is going to go, oh, the next one's the ETH one. Hmm. Now, ETH is half the size of Bitcoin, or maybe just less. So if you put the same hundred, you know, if you put the same billion dollars into Bitcoin and then move it into ETH, it's going to have an outsized effect. It's putting the same size elephant into a smaller bathtub. (laughs) And that's what happens. And then the money flows out of ETH and goes out of the risk curve into stuff less liquid, and those things really rip. So it's actually just a pure macro cycle. It's nothing unusual. It's the same cycle that you and I have grown up with. Um, People just don't see it as such because the moves are so ridiculous. Uh, Because people don't see it through the volatility. Well, look, it's also an election cycle year. Election cycle years are always positive. Yeah. Because there's always going to be stimulus to bribe voters. So to go against that... To go against the forward-looking business cycle is a very tough call. You would be doing it because emotionally you want that bear market or recession, not because the data leads you to believe it should be. I mean, it, it is what it is. Maybe we get a recession, maybe we don't. But either way, my, my view at the beginning of all of this it was going to be more like 1990, which was mild, shallow, with some lagged effects on real estate and wages and unemployment. And I think that that still feels about right. Now, do we get negative GDP growth? I I don't know. I I still think we do. And it might be this quarter. um, And it might be, you know, Q1. But I'm not sure. But it it doesn't really matter. Not outright. And the rate of change of liquidity has been improving all year. And by most measures of liquidity, whether using um, Global M2, or, you know, other measures of, of liquidity, We've seen an ongoing improvement in it. 
the balance sheet use is kind of the real juice on top of that. And we have seen bits and pieces here and there of balance sheet use, but that's not been the big driver. The big driver has actually been the net liquidity measures in most countries. And Fed net liquidity, I know you've talked about this as well, <clears throat> is really when you take into account the three main pillars of liquidity in the United States, because the US is the main liquidity driver. We'll talk about other regions later. Um, you know, yes, the Fed are doing QT, but that's been, and in addition, the Treasury were increasing the Treasury general account. And for a while, that was breaking the bond market. The last leg of the bond market was the bond market going, no, 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 we can't uh, deal with this new issuance because uh, liquidity conditions are too tight. And then the reverse repo started draining, and the reverse repo has dropped a gigantic amount and will probably drain to somewhere near zero. And that has offset all the liquidity. In fact, liquidity is up on the year. The Fed net liquidity is up 12% this year. That has a multiplier effect due to debasement effects and just general liquidity. And so, you know, that 20, that 12% um, led to 20% in the S&P, 48% in the NASDAQ, and call it 150% in crypto. Mm -hmm. I think people are confusing current economic conditions with the recession that they desperately want versus the markets discounting it, the forward-looking stuff like crypto and tech discounting it in 2022. They all have raging bear markets. Right now, we've got the Russell 2000, oil, copper, all of these things in present-day slow economic conditions. Do we get a full recession or not? doesn't really matter. A, it was priced in, in the stuff that I care about. But the forward-looking stuff, all of the forward-looking indicators from ISM are all pointing firmly higher. So we're around the trough of the cycle. Doesn't mean inflation picks up from here. In fact, because inflation is so lagging because of owner equivalent rents and wages, that it should continue to deflate all of 2024, particularly at the core level. And the headline level, we think, continues to fall. So, you know, we're still of the camp that headline inflation probably gets to zero uh, next year and core inflation too which I don't think anybody's prepared for because everybody's on the sticky inflation camp. Now, let's worry about inflation in the next business cycle when it heats up, not at the beginning of the business cycle. That's the macro summer, spring to summer transition is generally falling inflation, rising growth. And that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, all the forward-looking stuff is, is clearly macro spring into macro summer. So this was Raul Pal in his broad economic outlook, suggesting a transition from macro spring to macro summer characterized by falling inflation and rising growth and a typical good season for cryptocurrencies. Feel free to share your thoughts and engage in the discussion in the comments section. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. Thanks for watching.